Good morning. Welcome. We are so glad to see all of you here. And for those of you that aren't physically here but are with us virtually, we welcome you. We know that there's so much going on in the world today, and um, our hearts are with you. And we pray that we can be together today to pray for those that are less fortunate than us, to pray for those that can't get to church today, um, that we remember them and that we keep them in our hearts and remember that that is why we are here today. We are also here today because it is MCOR Sunday, and we will have a message today from Barbara on that. So we're excited. And now I'm going to ask you to stand so that we can move into the call to worship with Ryan. Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. The Lord be with all who are suffering this morning. Please join me in the opening prayer. Lord God, you promised Moses to protect your children through the waters of the Red Sea. You promised Isaiah you would be with them as they pass through the waters of tribulation. You promised Joshua you would open the promised land and part of the Jordan River. Carry all your children through the rivers of Ukraine today in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, This Is My Father's World. Good morning. Uh, it's time to worship God through our hearts. Uh, and we are going to sing this. This is my father's words as an opening game. Verse one, two, three. <coughs> Today is Umcor Sunday. Oh, great. What does that mean? We have to listen to last week's sermon again? I hate reruns. Um, not Encore. Umcor. U-M-C-O-R. That stands for United Methodist Committee on Relief. 
Okay, the only thing worse than reruns is another committee. So what's the relief part about? Do you ever watch the news on TV? I actually prefer cartoons. But yes, yeah, sometimes when the news comes on while I'm changing channels, it always seems like there's something bad happening. Storms, earthquakes, war. Nothing I can do about that stuff. It just makes me depressed. Well, that's what UMCOR is all about. Helping others when bad things happen to them. Instead of getting depressed, we can actually do something about it. How am I supposed to help someone from another state or even country? Well, some people actually do go to other states and countries to help, using their talents to rebuild, cook, do whatever they can. But if you can't do that, you can donate money for building materials, food, and more to support those workers. So I could collect money like we did for the Heifer Project? Yes, yes, of course. There are many worthwhile charities that help people. UMCOR is great because 100% of your donation goes to the cause directly to the people who need it when disaster strikes. Well, that sounds a lot more productive than sitting around being depressed all the time. It's hard to be depressed when you're doing God's work, helping and loving others. We can make the world a better place when we all work together. All right, so that was a little uh, message about what UMCOR is. Uh, some of you may remember back a few years ago, I think it was 2014, when we sent a team of people to Oklahoma to rebuild after the tornadoes there. That was funded by UMCOR. We paid our own way, but they bought materials, tools, and everything for us to use. So they're all over the world wherever relief is needed. Uh, so today, UMCOR Sunday, when you give to an UMCOR project, 100% of your donations go to the project. Nothing goes to the administration of UMCOR. And so we have one Sunday a year. It used to be called One Great Hour of Sharing, uh, but now we call it UMCOR Sunday. And your donations today go toward the administration of the programs. They have to keep the lights on in the offices by printer ink and so on. Uh, so your donations today go 100% toward the administration and then throughout the year when people give to the actual initiatives or projects, 100% of those funds go toward that project. Um, so today being UMCOR Sunday, uh, there's a couple ways to give, actually three ways. One, you can go on to the link that Debbie sent out. Uh, there's a big list of uh, things to fund at UMCOR and one of them is UMCOR Sunday. So if you put your amount on that line, that will go toward the UMCOR Sunday. Uh, you can write a check to St. Matthew's, put it in the offering plate, and write UMCOR Sunday on the memo line. Or if you just like have $5 you want to put toward UMCOR Sunday, I'm going to leave this on the back table in the narthex, and you can just give a little something that way. All right, thank you so much. I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. This is from Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. God's words for God's people. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, you may be seated. So, we get a chance to share our anthem today, our special music. I uh, can't wait for the choir to be back and singing, because um, uh, this is the sixth time I've been able to solo this year, and that may not be a good thing. So, uh, <laughs> we, I want to bring to you today, or 
Hannah and I will bring to you today with Kevin's help uh, this song called The Good Shepherd. We'll talk more about it in the message today. All right. Go ahead. I lay down my life for you. Enter in, enter in, enter in. I am the good shepherd. As the Father knows me, I know you, I know you, I know you, I know you, and no one can take you away, and no one can take you away.
beauty of that song, uh, written by a couple of folks and, and made famous by uh, Fernando Ortega, a favorite of mine, uh, great meditation music. But it, it sings like a psalm. You notice in the first line it was first person, and then it was the first person of Jesus to us. The second line, second verse, it's Jesus hearing us respond to him. If you read the Psalms with, you know, any regularity, and I would suggest if you don't know what to pray, if you get to the point where you've seen enough news, you've heard enough bad things going on in the world, you just don't know what to say. Well, scripture tells us two things. One is just be quiet. Just sit in silence. Let the Holy Spirit utter the words of the prayer within you. Don't keep saying things you don't mean or don't know how to get to. And the second is you read a psalm because the psalms are written in such a way that it's God talking to us at points. It's us talking to God at certain points. Sometimes it's a conversation between us and the Lord. And the psalms themselves were prayers prayed so many times that they were finally recorded. They were written down, 150 of them. By the way, there were more than 150 psalms But there were only three cycles of the Jewish calendar. I wasn't even going to preach on this, but let me just teach you one thing here. Okay, so there's such a thing as a lunar calendar, and it was used methodically and in most of the world before the Romans took over the known world. And so when the Roman calendar was created, it was really created around pagan holidays. Most of the words we have, like June and July and August, they come from other sources They're not Christian terms. They're not religious terms. But the Jewish calendar prior to the Roman occupation was a perfectly balanced lunar calendar, which, by the way, in some parts of Asia are still being used today. And that perfect balance did not mean there was a fourth year where we had the moon quite not where it should be. So, hey, let's just add another day to the calendar. That's how we did it. In other words, take a round peg and a square hole and just use a bigger hammer. So that's kind of the way Western culture was formed, forged, I would say. Now, the whole point of this is that the Psalms were in perfect balance because they would use 50 of them in one cycle of the lunar calendar. So by the time you got through three cycles, you would have exactly 150 Psalms that would be used. So that's why the Bible has 150. There are others that are out there, but kind of the the best of uh, collection is the 150. There's another theory. There were 150 steps to the entrance to the temple. And if you prayed one psalm per day, you would start on the ground and you would end up in the front of the first courtyard and on your way to the Holy of Holies. I like that one better. But let's go back to the scripture today. This is about Jesus, who is, if you listen to what was being read today, or if you have the scripture in front of you again, you can look at this. You'll find here this amazing kind of um, clarity in the scripture about Jesus sitting with, dining with, and being with, and I love these categories, tax collectors and sinners. Um, That's like choirs that are alto, soprano, and those guys. That's kind of how this worked. So there were the real sinners, the tax collectors, who were hated by all. They were hated by the Roman authority because they didn't seem to get all the money they were supposed to collect in on time. And they were hated by the Israelites, the Jews, because they were the ones that came around and knocked on your door and said, you owe this much. And they themselves took a pretty healthy cut off the top. So if you're going to pick two groups of sinners tax collectors, and all the rest of the sinners, this is the group Jesus is sitting with. But two other groups show up, Pharisees and scribes. Those are the lawyers and the legal assistants that follow the lawyers and write everything down. So these are the groups that are before Jesus as he starts off on this really interesting set of parables. And this one happens to be about the lost sheep. There's another one about a lost coin. And then You know probably the third, most famously in Luke 15, is the prodigal son, which has been, unfortunately, you know, sort of 
titled in your Bibles. They're usually a little descriptive above the paragraph when you're reading in the scripture. By the way, don't get the title mixed up with scripture. That was added way later. But they talk about the prodigal son as being the one who is lost. And really, it's the older, the older brother that's lost. The, the son gets found. The son comes home. The son and the father reconcile. It's the oldest who stuck around and did all the hard work that had the most problem. Well, let me back up to this. Who had the most problem? The 99 that were safe and secure within the bounds of the shepherd's flock or the one who wandered away? So let me ask you, who do you think is more lost? 99 who think they're righteous and have it all put together? Or somebody that goes off, gets lost, And it's tracked down by the Lord himself and then brought home and celebrated. Which one is more lost? I'm actually asking you a question. (laughs) Help me preach today. In fact, I've got a mic here for you. Who do you think is the more lost of the group? The 99 who felt like they were already in right standing with the shepherd, meaning with God, And had no need to repent, or the one that actually got lost, repented and came home. Yeah. It's a new way to think. We've never really, I can say it's a new way to think. I don't think we've ever thought of it like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm stalling long enough here. I don't have all day, but, you know, we can work on this. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. We're all lost. You think we're all lost? In different ways. Okay. All right. We all have our cross to bear. All right. Good, 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 good. Nathan's on camera today. This is going to be fun, by the way. I think the 99. You think the 99 are more lost than the lost? Yeah, because they think they're already saved and and they don't have to worry anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think the one that that got lost is the one that's probably in better shape. Yeah, yeah. Better shape now that he got found, too, right? Okay. Hang on. Uh, we can become complacent. Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah. We certainly can. Um, churches love complacency. Because we want one place in our life that's less complicated, where we're guaranteed a community that's not so conflictual. Although I wouldn't necessarily say that's the best description of a church, but <laughs> and a place that we can count on all the time. It's why we have so many traditions in worship that help us, right? Because we're looking for solid ground. We're looking for the rock. We're not looking for sand. And so who was it that Jesus gave the rights of the church to, right? Peter. Peter, the word comes from Petra, which comes from the word rock. So he basically said, upon you, Peter, and your followers, this will be This will be the rock in which you stand. That's why the descendancy of all the popes comes from the lineage of Peter, the one on which the church is built, not on Paul and not on any of the other apostles. But interesting thing about this. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Just for the record, uh, Lynn also says the 99. The 99. But for my perspective, uh, I'm just wondering if... I mean, if we can all be lost, is the one who's more lost more? I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily agree that the 99 are automatically <laughs> the worst in this situation. Right. Uh, I think that right. I don't have to get totally lost. <laughs> I no. could get totally complacent or overconfident in myself. But Right. Uh, right. So Jesus actually answers the question. He says, when the shepherd brings back the one sheep, What does he do? He goes to his friends and his neighbors and he celebrates. I lost a sheep. I found that sheep. I'm I'm celebrating with you because Jesus says, wouldn't it be better? And don't the angels actually celebrate when one person who's lost actually turns around, repents, the word to repent, to turn around and start heading in a better, healthier direction or a direction back toward God. 
So the celebration is for that one. Or the 99 that stand around and say, I never was lost, never have been lost. It's all those other sinners out there that we need to be concerned about. So this is part of our, yes. Uh, or Jesus celebrated us when we became found. Ah. And now we're just, you know, each time somebody's found, they're, they're moved to the 99. Okay, so the 99 are the one and the one and the one and the one that's already Why found. Why not? That's right. I guess I'm done here today, aren't I? <laughs> I don't think I've ever given permission to interrupt, but that's absolutely. I was one of those who was considered unchurched. I mean, that was my that was my family history. Didn't go to church. My parents actively avoided the church. My grandmother was abandoned by her father, who was a pastor when she was just a young girl because he walked into the kitchen and said, I'm going to go preach Jesus to the pygmy tribe of Africa. They need to know who Jesus is. And that's the last time she ever saw her father. Her sister and her brother, her two sisters and her brother, they, they all felt pretty much the same way. And then their mother, who ended up having her husband abandon her in the name of Jesus Christ, um, she died several years later uh, of some disease. And um, so my great aunt was the one who raised my grandmother and her sister and the brother. They didn't hate God. They just hated the church that kept talking about how faith needs to be more important than anything. Now, my great-grandfather was quite a famous evangelist. He, he was uh, considered in the Presbyterian Church one of the persons who led the Great Awakening of the turn of the 20th, 19th to 20th century. His sermons are still out there on the, on the interweb, you know. He, he's, he's one of those people that others from a distance would say, what a faithful man that was. My grandmother would describe him as a lost soul. One of his other daughters, my great aunt Agatha, she decided to find out what happened to him. So she, when she became an adult and finished raising the family and getting them into school, she went off to Africa and found his gravesite. He died of malaria not too long after he got there. So that's my family history. On my mom's side, faithfully avoiding the church. So some would look at me, and some did, as I was growing up. I can remember as a teenager or as a younger child, and people would come to school, and they'd talk about this story they heard about Noah's Ark, and they say, oh, this is so much fun, and, you know, God put them on two by two and all this. And I just thought it was all folklore, fairy tale. I, I had no point of reference, not until I was a teenager and sought it out for myself. So that's how my brother and I found a church, started going to youth group because we were too old to be in Sunday school so we went to youth and and we we heard these stories for the first time but in that group in that group I learned a lot about repentance is not saying you're sorry I'm sorry this is how most people see Christian repentance Nathan I'm going this way so I'm sorry God I'm really sorry I'm heading this direction oh that was terrible I'm sorry this is not repentance. This is stupidity. This is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Repentance literally means to turn. So repentance is to say, God, I know that what just happened in my life, I hurt a lot of people. It was destructive for me. It might have torn my family apart. And repentance would have been the turn. Okay, so now I understand. I often thought about the message my great-grandfather preached, which was one of repentance. He was part of that revival movement in which it was really more fire and brimstone, where there was two directions, heaven or hell. You either had to turn or you burned. I mean, it was just simply that clear a message that he preached, but I, I kept thinking that he was heading this way. I keep hearing your call, God, to serve you. Yes, I know I have a wife and four kids, but sorry about that. 
And each step sort of led him in another direction. Now, I can't cast judgment on somebody I never met. I don't know how many lives he affected in a positive way. I know God uses all of us. No matter how useful we think we are, God is going to use everything we do, stupid or otherwise. God is going to renew everything in our life to make it a blessing for somebody else. That's the beauty of resurrection, right? But that turning that turning a new direction. This is what Jesus is talking about. There will be a greater celebration when one person turns than 99 who are convinced that they don't need to turn at all. And he's speaking who now? He's speaking to the Pharisees, the scribes, who are sitting in judgment against the tax collector and all those other sinners. And so they're arrogance and their pride that we're in the right place but obviously these other people are in the wrong place Jesus is speaking directly to them there was also a lot of money that was involved so the widow's mite or this about the widow who has two coins and she loses one she spends all day tearing her house apart when she finds that other coin she celebrates because she found the coin and who does she celebrate with I love this she doesn't just celebrate in her house. She doesn't, she doesn't put it on Facebook. She actually goes out into the street with her neighbors and her friends and said, I found the lost coin. Now, these are parables. These are stories. But Jesus is saying the celebration is probably as important as the person's found or the sheep that's found or the coin that's found. And therefore, when we get to the prodigal son, doesn't it make sense when the son returns and the father rushes to him and embraces him? And the boy says, I, 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 I'm not worthy, Father. I'm not worthy of any of this. I have squandered my inheritance. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against the community. I took, I took something from you that I should have never taken from you. And the father just scoops him up, takes him in, gives him a big old fat, won the Super Bowl ring. He gives him everything he needs. And what does he do next? He throws a party and he kills the fatted lamb. Now, that's not the one that Jesus found over here. I just want to get this clear that there's... The end of the three stories is not, oh, that big old sheep got fatter and then they killed him. No, this is about taking the best of their stock to make sure that the celebration was real. And the older brother, who never felt like he was doing anything wrong the whole time, never got what he thought he was going to get. So in the stories of the parables... We find here this interesting kind of notation for us. And the notation is really about how we are approaching our faith journey and really wondering whether God's involved with this at all. Well, believing is one way to do this. Yes, a lot of people believe that there is a God and they believe that there was probably someone who was called the Son of God and even believe in spirits or spiritual life or having something around us that's esoteric or ethereal. So it's kind of this idea that that there's something out there beyond my understanding. But believing in a good shepherd is not enough. Believing that there is a good shepherd or knowing something about him, the scripture would say, is not enough. If we trust, however, in this good shepherd, if we're willing to lay down our life for him in our service and have the assurance that he's laid his life down for us, that moves us into a place where maybe we are that lost sheep that's standing up there on that invisible hill, you know. It's kind of this idea that the relationship is a real one when we trust and lean on God. But I think the further step is this, is when we truly lean on the shepherd, when we allow God at times in our lives to just pick us up, put us on our put us on God's shoulders and carries us back into a place of safety and celebrates the fact that it's okay if we were out there for a while. The celebration is that you've come home. Now, apparently, we as a church embrace that. Come home. Welcome home. We got home all over our home. We got banners about our home, above the trellis and above the walkway. But truly, to welcome somebody home means not to leave them down there, out there someplace, saying, this is us and that is you. If the 99 here in this church 
find ourselves being kind of content about the fact that all 99 of us are pretty darn happy with each other and one walks by that needs us, where would the Lord be? Where would the Lord be on a Sunday morning if 99 were having a great worship service, but one was walking by that needed the Lord most? If he physically was here with us, he'd be out that back door and he'd be off down the sidewalk. And you'd go, well, wait a minute. I thought we were the house of God. This is the arrogance of the church. Frankly, it's the arrogance of most Christians I know, including myself at times. Kind of like, I got something. I'd like to share it with you, but eh, maybe next time. Or the kind of reaction that's happening right now in the church. Uh, yesterday, Stephanie and I were at the funeral service, the memorial service, for one of the most amazing pastors I've ever known. I'll tell you about Edmund Moore someday and his signing of a declaration in Mississippi in 1963 that segregation should be eliminated in the schools, in the communities, in the restaurants, the shops, and the stores, in school bathrooms and separate drinking fountains that we would have different water going to serve those people as opposed to my people. He's a brave man. Coming back to this whole understanding of, of you know, the idea of us um, being in connection with each other and not having this kind of pride or arrogance, we ran into our former bishop, uh, Marianne Swenson, from many years ago. And Bishop Marianne was there to honor and more, and we walked up the aisle to say hi to her, and first she, she, she recognized me. I thought, that was great. You know, she gave me a hug and said, hey, Jim, how are you doing? Turned to Stephanie and said, the best representative of a Greek who's a Methodist is right here, she said, <laughs> in the aisle. And then she started talking about what she's doing on Zoom every day, because you see, the president of Ukraine is uh, Ukrainian Orthodox. And the priests that work with her, who are fighting for peace in the background, who are doing everything they possibly can to motivate and move the church forward, to have voices heard, and then their connections with people who are inside Russia and are very close in the advisement circles of Putin. These are the people that are leading, bishops and priests and a metropolitan. That's, um, that's as high as you get in the Orthodox Church, but never into the place of a pope who has some singular message from God that is brought to the people. So Orthodoxy does not follow in this lineage of the descendancy of Peter and does not follow that kind of order of church. Just like our bishops are not, they're Episcopal leaders, they're not kings or queens and they certainly aren't what considered a, maybe a metropolitan would be, and they certainly would be not a pope. So all these hierarchies didn't really matter as here's a retired bishop who's spending her hours through the night trying to negotiate peace through the back channels of the church. Yes, the Methodist church is very functioning in Ukraine and in Russia. UMCOR and the work that's being done there doesn't get publicized. Not the Red Cross. We're not trying to get someone else to donate to this. We, from the inside out, are doing the work that's over there. We have tens of thousands of missionaries that are on the streets right now trying to get people food and water and shelter. And it's not the only organization. It's just one of the organizations that's doing this work. So I want to just say that it, it is important for us to understand always that God is someone to be leaned on, to be trusted, not just someone to be believed in. This is not an intellectual exercise of faith that brings us peace and efforts moving forward. So can we trust and believe that God is in pursuit of the church? That if sometimes the church is the lost entity, or we as a church person might kind of lose our way once in a while because we really feel like we're okay and we don't need to be turning a lot. We, we feel like our, our direction's pretty good. So maybe we don't have that same sense, 
even in Lent, that a little repentance and confession is good for us, but it's also good to reset once in a while, turn back toward God and say, okay, what's next? But can we trust that God is always pursuing us and the church? Do you think God is always pursuing the church? Always ready to help move us in a direction that helps us reach others in the name of Jesus Christ? Or did God already do that once back when Jesus gave his life? Is God not actively involved in the church any longer? It's not a rhetorical question. I'm asking, do you believe and trust that God is pursuing us as the church? I do too. There's, there's a lot of things wrong with every denomination. Certainly there's things wrong with churches. We're human institutions, right? We're, we're a bunch of humans trying to do the best we can to serve God, but sometimes we don't get it right or sometimes we get it wrong. I mean, who propagated the segregation of blacks and other ethnicities and other people of color in the South for hundreds of years in this country? Who stood at the side of the auctioneers who were selling people, praying for God's good work to be done as this woman was sold off into the rights of some other human being? There were pastors and churches. Who housed the people who were brought off the slave ships and fed them until they could find owners? It was the church. We have sinned in many ways throughout the centuries. Who were the ones who led the crusades? who said that any person who would not claim the name of Jesus Christ would not only just be exiled, but you will be killed, and you will be killed by Christian soldiers. That was called the Crusades. What a horrific chapter in the history of the church. I believe that God continually seeks after the church and is continually trying to speak to us and give us direction. And there are times as a church, as an organization, we have to stop and turn and say, wow, God, we really did not understand, or I didn't understand, and I, forgive us. Forgive us for what we've done, and set us in a direction that is where you're heading us. Johnny and friends has been in the Ukraine. They're continuing to seek the lost ones there. They're continuing to seek all of those who are in the condition of this young man and cannot get out of the country and can't even get from the third story of the building they're in down to the ground floor so they can leave. We don't know how many of our friends who are mobility challenged, you know, have died in this war. They're, they're not even on some of the rolls. And there are some orphanages that don't have the kind of records that even intact would let us know everybody's there because there just isn't that kind of focus these are part of the 10,000 that they were trying to get out a couple of days ago. The focus was to make sure that in total they could try to address the needs, special needs of people who just could not care for themselves. It's another great organization. Wheels for the World that we raise money for have been able to help on a kind of a side, um, through the side door of this effort. But our local chapters of this particular ministry and Johnny's, you know, efforts. Um, she actually, in ill health, got on the national news and, and gave a message for the world to hear about the work that needs to be done. We do great things when the shepherd finds us and when we trust the shepherd himself. So can we trust that God will pursue you and me? Yes, yes. So I want to close with this hymn. Uh, it's one of my favorites, and we haven't sung it yet here in our church, at least since I've been here, and it's Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's a song of repentance. You know? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Do you know this? Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's do it one more time. Turn your eyes 
from Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Yeah, the choir's back. <laughs> amen and amen. We now move into a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. We pray for peace everywhere. Lord, we pray for those in the Ukraine. We pray for those in the midst of war. We pray for our Kalpak churches, for the Bethel Korean Mission Church and the Tascadero UMC. We pray for families in mourning the families of Katie, Michael, Matt, and Bruce on their passing. Lord, we pray that you be with them during this time of grief. Amen. We pray for health and recovery for, for all, and especially for Chuck, Barbara, Gonzalo, Lynn, Leslie, Carol, Ruby, Kathleen, Judy, Joanne, Cal, Tom, Marion, John, and the Valderas family. We pray for all of those in cancer treatment, continued treatment, Donna, Ron, Gary, Joanne, Joshua, Ruby, Ariel, Pat, Dick, Romana, Bob, Tony, Sylvia, Stephanie, Brandon, Lynn, Joey, Melissa, Debbie, and all others, and families with those in hospice, including Richard's mother and Carol's, Carol's mother. Lord, we pray that you be with all these people and that you open our hearts. Join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now invite you to open your hearts and think about how you can contribute back to God, especially on this UMCOR Sunday as we prepare for the offertory. Russia's invasion of Ukraine last February 24 is the major escalation of conflict that began in 2014 and is the most deadly military action in Europe since World War II. This situation is deeply distressing and has created an alarming humanitarian crisis. As of today, March 15, the UN estimates that 2.8 billion people have left Ukraine for sanctuary in Poland, Hungary, Romania and Slovakia. The EU projects in total will be exceeding 5 million. This does, does not include, include people, people displaced, displaced inside, inside Ukraine. Ukraine. In, in response, response, the United Methodist, Methodist Committee on Relief, AMCOR, is initially working through partners on the ground in Ukraine and in neighboring nations to meet such immediate needs as food, water, and temporary shelter for those fleeing the violence. Those partners in Ukraine include the small and courageous United Methodist Church, and on the regional level, the United Methodist Churches in Poland, Romania, Hungary, and Slovakia, among others, as well as the ACT Alliance, an international network of faith-based organizations working in 120 countries. We have received many offers of goods such as blankets, shoes, strollers and diapers to be collected in the United States and shipped to the locations of those displaced. While these offers are natural and appreciated, we are not able to accept and transport these gifts. The shipping cost is high and the process is slow. Instead, we are working with partners in Europe to secure supplies there. This makes the supplies more quickly available and in some cases help local economies. UMCOR has also received numerous offers from volunteers ready to provide on-site assistance. 
Right now, our partners have asked the volunteers to hold back. Attention is now fully devoted to providing for the immediate needs of refugees, and the organizations do not have the capacity to manage the logistical and linguistic needs of volunteers. When the time is right, and it may be months into the future, those managing the refugee services may issue a call for volunteers. I am grateful for the generous support United Methodists and others are providing through UMCOR's International Disaster Response and Recovery Advance for relief in Ukraine. As the situation unfolds, our efforts to alleviate suffering and advance hope and healing will continue, and we will keep the Church informed on developments and needs. Let us join in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Lord, we pray that you bless this offering as we humbly give back just a fraction of so much that you've given us. We pray that you bless the hands that distribute this, that it may do your will. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Verse 1, 2, 3. <coughs> Please join me. I believe we're not going to be singing that right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but let's just try the first verse here. Um, for those of us that know this, do you remember this? Oh, please, thank you so much. Yeah. Great. This is about communication.
Let us turn to thee, O God, that is what has been written about you and we know of you, that when we turn to you, Lord, you are always there to embrace us, to carry us to the next place, and to celebrate when we have made this journey in your name, through your power, and through your love. Be with us now, Lord Jesus, as we turn and turn again back to the ways that you have led us and want to lead us again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Good morning. Hi. Now we can pull that out again. Time for Life of the Church. <laughs> what do we have going on? Hospitality workshop. Is that today? Yeah, it is. How exciting. Today, right after church, we have a hospitality workshop at noon at Linda and Rob's house. Bring a lunch. Bring a snack. Bring some fun. Men's breakfast, Saturday, April 2nd at 8 a.m. at Denny's. And pickles. Oh, that sounds good. Saturday, April 9th, men's study, and on Wednesdays, 11 a.m. in the fireside room with Pastor Jim, we have ministry happenings, Strength to Love, speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with Tina Martin on Zoom. Those are on Thursdays at 11. And don't forget, Conejo Connect is here still Wednesdays, the next two Wednesdays, 5.30 to 7.15. We are in Partnership with Thousand Oaks and Westlake Village UMC. So come and uh, do that. That'll be a fun, fun thing. I think we have some birthdays today, a couple, right? Oh, Quilting Fellowship, okay. We got a lot going on. Holy Week, Monday, Thursdays at UMC Thousand Oaks, okay? So don't show up here. And Holy Week, Sunrise Service and Traditional Worship with the Choir. <gasps> That makes me so happy. Okay, save the date. Oh, we're just going to go all the way to June here. All right, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Thank you for the altar flowers, Janice, and Coffee Fellowship, the other Janice. The Janice is coming through for us today. And you have an opportunity to get Easter lilies, either calla lilies or an Easter lily. So make sure you fill that out today if you could. And happy birthday. Krista Lamb and Pat Mon. Happy birthday. Are we ready to sing? Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Sing. And I would like to invite Nathan Inouye up. Is he here to speak for SPRC? Oh, hey, Nathan. Everybody goes, uh-oh, when the SPRC comes. It's always good news. Don't be like that. <laughs> it is good news. Um, and while Nathan's come on and up, um, we just want to say that Kevin is uh, hes still uh, working uh, and helping and assisting another church, and we just missed the communication there. So he he didn't sneak out because he wanted to. He sneaked out because he had to. So anyway, but we want to honor uh, Nathan. Come on up and take the mic again. We'll pull this out for you. I do want to say something here, <laughs> but but with you, just just I, I want to say when we uh, when we were overjoyed to bring Hannah into the church uh, here just a month ago to be our director of music. Uh, we, were, we were overjoyed, and she has already gotten the choir together and gotten our rehearsals going, but um, this has led to some decisions that she needs to make in order for her life and ministry to go forward. So this actually is her last Sunday with us. So it's welcome and then the next thing happens. And, but we wanted to take time to honor her, so I'll, I'll turn that over. Yeah, so Hannah, if you don't mind coming on up, on up here, and we just wanted to just sh show our appreciation for um, your time with us. Um, every moment, every uh, sound of music that you shared with us is truly a gift uh, from God, and so thank you very much. And uh, if the church can just uh, appreciate her as well, and so thank you very much.
Welcome, Welcome home. home. All right. Thank you. It's one of the things I missed in the last couple of days with everything else that's been going on was how we've 